The day is in the midst of a year-long look at affordable housing in the region. What specifically do you think the legislature should do to help people who can't afford to buy a home or are struggling to rent an apartment? Thank you very much for the question. I think it's a very important one that affordable housing is necessary in our state. Um, I know there's been discussion on the 830G and uh, what that means, and I think that it's important that, you know, we had a law that was in place for a long time, and it never hurts to review again to see if it's actually working. I know it, it had a mandate that um, the towns are not necessarily a mandate, but that the town should try to get 10% of their housing as affordable housing. I think some of the breakdown is what do we actually mean what is the definition of affordable housing. So I think we need to look at that because um, I know that 30 percent is the uh, number that's used. If you're spending more than 30 percent uh, of your income on housing, it's not, it's not affordable housing. So I think we need to really look at that. There's over I know in one of the national studies looking at Connecticut, 84,000 500 uh, houses are necessary to fill that gap. So I think it may be the approach that is used because I think everyone would agree that people should have affordable housing. It, it really impacts the quality of life and I believe people should be able to look at their communities, have good schools, have uh, the ability to find a, a district of their choice. Parallel to that, I also believe that um, the local, the local municipalities should have some voice in where the the affordable housing would be placed. So I think that's part of the discussion right now in the general assembly. Um, let's not take away local control, but let's look at the 830G. See if it what its original intent, has it accomplished that? And I, I don't think it has because only about 18 percent of the towns in the state of Connecticut have actually met that goal. On the other flip to that is that the, my towns, my district have all submitted their affordable housing plans. So that's good news. Let's just let them work to accomplish that goal. I happen to work with TVCCA for many years, so I'm very sensitive to the issues of lifting people out of poverty. So I do believe that having an affordable house or a house that you can rent that's affordable is crucial, again, to having a quality life. Thank you. Connecticut recently enacted a law designed to provide safeguards against lawsuits for out-of-state patients seeking abortions in Connecticut and any provider who helps them. Do you support efforts to make Connecticut such a safe haven? Thank you for that question as well. I know this has been a very uh, hot topic throughout the state right now. And I would like to just say that I would never uh, seek to limit a, a person's choice. I believe that should be between the individual and their conscience how they approach that. There was a bill in the legislature, however, and I think that's where some of this is being generated um, that really was an expansion of abortion in the state. And as a safety measure, I think we have to look at what we do when we classify it as um, uh, aspiration abortion. What do we mean by that? And I think if you look back at some of the testimony and what occurred with that bill, uh, the, the medical society was coming out, those individuals that would be performing the abortions did not go through the scope of training. So I would just like to say that I don't want to be characterized as someone that would try to prevent somebody from having that choice. However, that is not interpreted correctly. I do sit on public health. So I was involved in those discussions, and the bill actually was also tied to the safe harbor piece, which I am definitely in favor of. Um, but because of those particular provisions in the bill, I think it was 54-14, that um, didn't have those professionals. That's not to say that uh, they could not, but that they were not, they did not go through the same training. But I think it's um, misinformation out there to say that uh, many, I know many of my colleagues who also voted no for similar reasons 
to be classified as being uh, in a camp that would prohibit a woman from having choice. We know in the state of Connecticut that uh, women's right to choose was codified into law back, um, I think it was as far back as 1990. Um, so that's in place. There may be reason to look at some of the other areas, but um, that's primarily my, my position. The state's surplus has grown to over $4 billion. Do you support the decision to use some of that to lower the state's pension debt, or do you think more should be returned to the taxpayer? Another very <laughs> apropos question, and it's a good one. Um, I'm, I'm first, let me just say that I'm very happy to see that the state is in, a, in an area where we have surplus. Uh, that's important. Uh, over the years, we were not in that position. It took a lot of hard work. Um, and it was bipartisan work that got us to the position that we're in now. Um, I think everyone would agree to that. And then um, during the last, this last year, the influx of ARPA dollars, um, the federal monies that came in, even ballooned that budget to another extent. So now for the first time, we do have a quite, I think it's $4.4 billion in the uh, surplus account. So I do believe that we need to continuously work to pay down our long-term liabilities and our pensions. So I'm a strong proponent of doing that. That will save billions of dollars going forward in the future for our residents. So naturally, I am in favor of paying down on a consistent basis all the time the liability when we have that excess uh, funding. On the other point, uh, because I would compromise and take maybe a portion of that to return to our, high, our rate payers, our taxpayers that are uh, really uh, putting, that, that, that's part of the reason why we have such a big surplus. And they are right now, Connecticut is um, a very expensive state in which to live. People are working hard to just uh, get by. And I think they could use the additional funding to come down, you know, let's also look at our sales tax and some of the other taxes that we impose upon our, our residents. So I think I'm in the middle of the road on that one. I'd like to preserve a, a good enough safety valve so we don't find ourselves back in that position. We don't know what the future is going to be. Um, in the next couple of years, we're looking at, we have inflation, possible recession. So I want to be prepared that we don't have to go into the budget and start cutting those really essential programs that we've all worked so hard to get um, in place. So to answer it, I think I'm going around, but to answer you, it's I, I, I think we need to return, but we also need to be careful not to uh, take too much out of that um, surplus. How should Connecticut move forward to address climate change with regards to electric vehicles, wind power, and other, quote, clean energy strategies? Thank you for that question. Um, if I may, I would like to just take this moment to recognize Millstone Power Plant, which is in my district. And we know that the uh, continued operation of Millstone has actually allowed us to have a transition to clean uh, carbon and to have clean air. Um, so they need to be recognized for what they did to reach those goals that you're talking about with uh, climate change and having a 100% decarbonized state. Millstone, um, and I worked very hard in my district uh, back a number of years ago to really have Millstone recognized as such an important player with around-the-clock reliable energy. Uh, carbon-free energy, giving employees, we have 1,500 plus employees there and returning 1.5 billion to the state of Connecticut. So that was an enormous accomplishment to have Millstone recognized and then to get the procurement with the, um, with the state and Millstone to allow our ratepayer to, to be able to um, really offer some uh, return to the ratepayer. Everything Millstone has said has actually occurred, and we're seeing right now that energy costs are starting to uh, come down because of that procurement, the PP 
procurement that we made the power purchase agreement with Millstone at a four ninety nine per kilowatt um, hour. So I think we need to recognize Millstone to get to that. I have received a, a high score with the um, League of Conservation Voters. I consider myself a strong advocate for the environment, but within reason. So we're looking at the electrification of our vehicles, our buses, our trucks, which I am in favor of, but I'm not so sure about the and we want to reach the carbon goals by 2040, but I think we need to do this with some fiscal reality in place so that we don't overburden our businesses and our um, individuals that we that the, the, the uh, state actually workforce and their vehicles. Let's let's do what we can and let's move it accordingly at our stand and maybe national standards. So um, I am in favor. But again, with, with some reservation about the timetable and the fiscal uh, impact that it could have. So um, I, think, I think I answered what you asked. <laughs> do you think the 2020 election was conducted fairly and Joe Biden won? And do you support early voting and voting by mail initiatives? Thank you. Um, yes, I think the election was won. Uh, I was never someone who questioned that, um, and I think it was proven over uh, the time period that with all the cases that went out that he actually, that this was a bona fide election um, and that Biden did win, and I've always held that, that uh, position. Um, as far as voting, I think that was your question. Um, I am a again, a very strong advocate for um, really increasing vote, getting our democracy heard and empowered to, to vote. So I, I'm very pleased I supported the legislation that will allow the early voting question to be on the referendum coming up shortly in November um, at, on our election day. And we'll see what the uh, residents feel about that. But I do support it. I think some of the hesitation with the early voting was the logistics involved. Let's see. I think we're going to have to uh, bring in our uh, town clerks, our registrars, to be sure we do it correctly. Um, but to have election day is, you know, from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. And there are certain, and we do have also the absentee ballot, but uh, certain people that want to vote but they can't get out of whatever their commitment is on that day, this will allow them more time. And I think we should all encourage to have as, uh, as many individuals involved in our democracy that vote. That, that empowers everyone, and in the end it has such beneficial impact. Uh, for for our, our state um, to have people feel they're invested in their uh, government and that they have a voice. So I'm definitely in favor. Um, but I think, again, we have to be sure that everything is done in a fair manner and that there's some integrity involved on all of the uh, areas. And I think we can do that. I, I believe Connecticut's one of the few states that does not currently have early voting, so I'll be very interested to see uh, the results uh, on November the 8th. I think most people are going to be favorable, but they will want to know that there are safeguards in place, and I think that's going to be the job of the legislature to determine the timing and when, uh, how much time will be in place, and to also be um, give us the security that there will be fair, they will be fair um, voting. And within the region, short-term rentals have become an issue of sorts, including uh, Waterford. Um, how do you think the town and or state should move forward with addressing this issue? Right, so that kind of goes back a little bit to the original question that you asked about affordable housing. And, um, you know, Today, the cost of living is so expensive in the state that we need to do more um, to allow people to have the resources and the funding that they can uh, 
afford the rent that is in, uh, you know, it's it's fairly high in this region, the, the rent costs. So we need to work together to try to help people have that funding that they can really um, afford to live in the community. And I, I'm committed to doing that. I, I believe that every we live in a state that we should be able to have everyone uh, able to rent a, a home and live in it. And I think it's going to require the will, power, and a bipartisan way for us to come together to help people find those homes. Now, again, that also goes back to the affordable housing piece. Um, so we need to, as a community, understand that by affordable housing, we're not necessarily, it's not meaning big, high rises and complex, but more affordable housing would allow people to have more options for renting at a lower cost. Um, so I, I am an advocate also of finding those solutions.